Assalamu alaikum. So today we are going to talk about motor neuron disease. Motor neuron disease, what does it actually mean? So involvement of uh, the motor neurons. Now from where does the motor neurons they start? They start from the cerebral cortex, from the frontal lobe, as you would know, that the motor cortex is just like in front of a central circus, a central fissure. Which behind that is the sensory cortex lying in a parietal lobe. In front of it, it is the motor cortex lying in the frontal lobe. From where the neurons come down as cortical bulbar tracts and the cortical spinal tracts. As you guys would know, that as um, you can see this cursor which I am putting on, this is the motor cortex. From where the cortical bulbar tracts come to the motor nuclei of the cranial nerves uh, in the brainstem. And then the cortical spinal tracts, they come down and they decussate with the interhorn cells, the spinal cord. And now these are the motor neurons lying in the cerebral cortex. These are the motor neurons lying in the bulb of the, of the brain, that is in the brain stem. And similarly, if we go closely see over here, this is the motor neurons lying in the interhorns of the spinal cord. Either it is in the cervical area or it is in the dorsal spine or dorsal area thoracic uh, spine or this is the lumbosacral area so the motor neurons are affected by this disease process called as motor neuron disease as you will see this is Stephen Hawkins as a very famous um, physician physics specialist along with his Barack Obama Stephen Hawkins actually had motor neuron disease um, diagnosed many many years ago before actually he died and it's very very unusual actually because motor neuron disease people they generally die in a time span of about three years or so. So how do we have uh, what type of different types of motor neuron diseases we have got? Now, depending upon which motor neurons are affected, the name of the disease has been given the different names. That can be the the most commonest being is the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, in which the cortical spinal tracts and the cortical bulbar tracts they are involved simultaneously and the patients develop the features of uh, the sclerosis the hardening of uh, the descending cortical spinal tracts as well as atrophy of uh, the muscles atrophy of the muscles occurs once there is the affection the lesion of the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord or the motor nuclei of the of the bulb as you can see on the on the on the cursor if you can see very closely the ones the bulbar nuclei are affected, like say, if this is the nucleus of the 12th grain, uh, this hypoglossal nerve, what is going to happen? It leads to the atrophy of uh, of the of the of the trunk muscles, and that is uh, that is called as amyotrophy. Similarly, let me just give you the picture. Like let's say here, you can see the the left portion of the tongue is wasted. That's typically of bulbar parts. You see here in the in the hand. You can see a marked atrophy of uh, the small muscle of the hands. We're making a shape of a claw. And similarly, the muscles of uh, the forearm, they are also wasted. If you see this man, actually, you can't hold the head straight. And as you just, you know, leave the hand being given a spore to the head, the head will just fall interiorly. And you can see the whole, whole uh, structure of the individual. The muscles are wasted right here over here the chest and, and the arms and you can even see the toes are quite the trousers are have gone bigger because he has lost a lot of his mass so this is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis being the commonest one the second commonest uh, type of uh, the motor neuron disease is bulbar palsy in which uh, as you see the bulb is the name given uh, to the to the to the middle uh, it's a latin word bulbar palsy and in this case the patient will have the lower motor neuron disease affecting the kind of nuclei having a nuclei in the in, in, in the bulb or in the medulla like uh, ninth cranial nerve the tenth cranial nerve and the twelfth cranial nerve so the patient will have the bulbar palsy they are almost seen about 20 percent of the patients among the motor neuron disease patients by the way in the u.s uh, they use the whole uh, five different or six different types of motor neuron disease as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis by Berlin Britain. They gave it a separate entity, the amyotrophic sclerosis being one type, 
Burr palsy, another type, primary lateral sclerosis being another type, and spinal muscular atrophy being another type. Pseudoburr palsy is a terminology used when you have got uh, upper motor neuron disease affecting the cortical bulbar tract. As you can see, this cursor. See, this is the motor neurons lying in the cerebral cortex. And um, as it descends down, if this is affected, this is the pin nerve nucleus. And if this tract is affected, including the interhorn, this, uh, okay, this uh, cortical neuron, if this is affected. By the way, this disease is not primarily the disease of the tract. It is a disease of the neural cell body, actually. If this neural cell body is affected automatically, this cortical bulbar tract will also be affected. And this leads to the pseudobulbar palsy in this patient. Spinal muscular atrophy, as the name indicates, again, it's a, in which the patient will have the affection of uh, the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord, and the patient will not have upper motor neuron signs in this case because only anterior horn cells are affected over here, over here also, and the patient will have the lower motor neuron signs in the upper limbs as well as in the lower limbs. Primary lateral sclerosis is a very, very rare disease in which the patients will have the affection of the uh, motor neurons or motor neuronal cells lying in the, in the cortex. And that leads to the degeneration of the cells. Like and you can see this red line going down. This will be affected. And uh, while this anterior horn cell of the spinal cord is, is spared, so the patient have an upper motor neuron signs both in the lower limbs as well and as well as in the upper limbs as well. And by the way, sensations will always be normal in such cases. Now these are the few effects regarding the motor neuron disease. The most important point in this whole slide is you see the number second one. It's a rapidly progressive fatal disease that can affect any adult at any time. That's a very, very important point. And if you go and see the last point here is the motor neuron disease kills five people every day in UK. So that's an important point to be noted, basically. I've shown this slide to you earlier as well, just to give you an example. How does the motor neuron disease affect the muscles? Yet to give you a general information, again, an uh, explanation of ALS is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is a disease of the part of the nervous system that controls the voluntary movements. Amyotrophy means uh, uh, loss is without muscle enlargement, there is muscle wasting, and that muscle wasting is due to the loss of the nerve signals to the muscles. Lateral means to the side referring to the location of the damaged spinal cord, like cortical spinal tracts. Sclerosis means hardening or hardened nature of the spinal cord. So uh, just a repetition of what we have uh, read earlier. Uh, so we have got ALS is the most commonest variety or type of motor neuron disease. It's a mixed upper as well as lower motor neuron involvement. Patient will have the involvement of the limb. They generally start the limbs. Then the patient ultimately develops the bulbar muscles, means the motor nuclei situated in the medulla, and lastly, the patient develops the respiratory arrest. Another other types of uh, motor neuron disease, as I said earlier, is progressive muscular atrophy, primary lateral sclerosis, progressive bulbar palsy, flare arm syndrome, flare leg syndrome, and then amyotrophic lateral sclerosis plus syndrome. This is plus means the patient will have features of motor neuron disease along with other degenerative processes affecting the central nervous system like dementing illnesses, including frontotemporal dementia and Parkinsonism. Uh, family of, it's a family of diseases of unknown etiology. We really do not know what actually causes, but they are very hypothetical points, which I'm going to show you in the next slide. What are the different risk factors that have been uh, blamed for this disease process? It's a progressive degeneration of the upper as well as the lower motor neurons, leads to the wasting of the muscle and the weakness, Average survival, about 40% people, they actually survive five years. Median survival is two to five years. Median age of onset, or the mean age of onset is 56 years. Male to female ratio is about two is to one. Animal incidence is 
is two cases per 100,000 people per year. Prevalence is out of every 100,000 people, five to seven people will be having the motor neuron disease. If you take 100 patients of motor neuron disease, the family cases will be only five to 10 cases, while the 90% or 95% people will be sporadic. In the United States of America, 7,000 new cases of amyotrophic lack sclerosis are diagnosed each year. As I said earlier, that the familial cases are in total is 5 to 10 percent. And out of those familial cases, 20 percent familial cases, they are autosomal dominant and related to the mutations in the copper or zinc superoxide dismutase gene. There is a conflicting data showing that what are the different risk factors associated with the start of the development of the motor neuron disease. A person having a background of military service, having a work related with agriculture, factory work, heavy manual, exposure to the pesticides, exposure to the welding or soldering, exposure to the heavy metal, work in plastic industry, repetitive muscle use, athleticism, playing professional soccer, trauma, electrical shock, early onset alopecia, diagnosis of polymyositis, or decreased body fat. Well, if you just have a bird eye view on this slide, you would know and you will notice that hardly you can spare any individual actually, except I think uh, the persons belonging to the medical profession, they are only spared. Just everybody is, everybody will be engaged, everybody will be affected, or everybody will have a risk factor. So that means to avoid a motor neuron disease, I would not recommend that everybody should become a doctor. But if I go through this conflicting slide, except the medical professional people, everybody else is affected or has got a risk factor. To, to, to suffer from motor neuron disease. A very complex slide because the pathogenesis is very complex, some cellular mechanisms, some molecular mechanisms. The most important being is superoxide dismutase one mutation. That's the most important thing. Rest, I will not go into the much details of this complex slide. Uh, it's, a, it's a geographically random disease. Nobody's actually is, is, is immune to the disease. Um, but I think I would like to tell you that um, in Japan, uh, there's one peninsula called the Sky Peninsula, there's increased incidence in the prevalence of this disease there, where you find a combination of dementia and Parkinsonism with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Now, all these patients they present. See here, uh, the hundred percent people they present with the weakness, while constipation seen about sixty-five percent patients. Automatically, if the patient starts having uh, swallowing difficulty, so he will not be eating much. So you expect that the patient will have a constipation. And by the way, the, the 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 liquid intake, the swallowing for the liquid will be impaired much more earlier than the swallowing for the solid things, and that makes a main differentiation between a neurogenic dysphagia versus a mechanical dysphagia. And mechanical dysphagia, like you talk, if you're talking about a tumor in an esophagus, you will have a difficulty in swallowing the solids rather than the liquids. While in neurogenic cases, you get a difficulty in swallowing the liquids first, and then you will get the difficulty in swallowing the solids one. Insomnia, breathlessness, dribbling, pseudobulbar effect effect and a mood. Mood what's, mood is by definition is what you feel. You, your mood is good today. That means you're feeling good. And what other people draw out by looking at your face, by looking at your, by listening to your talk, is what is effect. Effect what other people think about you, what other people look at you, what other people think that you are suffering from. So the patient in this case is they start laughing um, uh, unexpectedly, they cry. So this is called a pseudobulbar effect. Sensory symptoms may occur, but by the way, sensory symptoms, symptoms may occur in the patient, but there are no signs because if you go into the exact anatomical detail or the facts of the motor neuron disease, you don't get any sensory changes in the sensory tract. Patient definitely will have a problem with the mobility. They will go to the anxiety and the depression and the communication. Difficulties do occur if the patient will have involvement or the pharyngeal muscles, or the facial muscles, and obviously the psychological issues. So what are the signs, uh, again, upper motor neuron signs, spasticity, hyperreflexia, moving plantars. 
suitable effect, lower motor weakness, wasting, fasciculations, hyperflexia, hypotonia. And if the bulbar muscles are affected, that means all those muscles, those were supplied by the vagus, the glossopharyngeal, and by, by, by the hypoglossal nerve. So the, the patient will have dysphagia and dysarthria and so on and so forth. By the way, intellect, memory, vision, and the hearing remains stable. Rarely you can have the third, fourth, and sixth rear nerve involvement. And sometimes, as I said earlier, the patient may have a frontotemporal dementia as well in these cases. This is how you diagnose such cases. You, as you can see, nerve conduction study is the cornerstone of this uh, uh, disease process as far as diagnosis is concerned. You can see on the top right corner, the uh, woman is doing a nerve conduction studies. Basically, a neurologist can do it or electrophysiologist can do it. We stimulate the nerves and we check how the conduction loss is going on. And then we put the needles also into the muscle belly and see how does it look like basically. As you can see, just on the right side of this uh, needle slide over here, this is the normal thing you see once you're putting a needle inside and you're asking a patient to contract a muscle. So that means you need to do, you need to know the exact uh, you know, action of that muscle where you're putting in the needle. And then you are, then in a neuropathic cases like in motor neuron disease, you will find this type of pattern. And if it's a primary muscle disease, you will get the C pattern as I'm putting my cursor here. Uh, well, you need to do a CT MRI, the brain as the spine, the blood test and the muscle biopsy to note the other causes of muscle weakness. Definitely, there are clinical diagnoses of hematophagal sclerosis. And a scorial criteria is worldwide being used uh, to diagnose. Um, the definitive clinical diagnosis actually depends upon upper and lower motor neuron signs in the bulbar and the two spinal regions or the three spinal regions like cervical, thoracic, and the spinal cycle. And then we've got a clinically probable and clinically probable, lab supported and clinically possible and suspected. So all these things, uh, you classify the disease or you try to come to the diagnosis by putting these diagnostic criteria. So what are the different differential diagnoses of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis? Just imagine, once you use the term a differential diagnosis, you mean to say, or you want to say, that what are the different diseases which can simulate or which can be confused with the motor neuron disease. So automatically, with diseases having com components of upper motor neuron signs, purely or maybe some of combinations may have a pure lower motor neuron signs, they will come under the category of, um, of a motor neuron disease. Like if you just imagine the patient has got a parasagittal tumor, a uh, parasitical tumor, I'm talking about a midline tumor in the brain, uh, over the calvaria, top of the brain, and it's pressing over the motor cortex bilaterally, that will cause a similar picture as you will see in patients with primary lateral sclerosis. Patient will not have a sensory symptoms, and patient will only have upper motor neuron signs in the lower limbs, as well as maybe in the upper limbs, as well, or mainly in the lower limbs, in the abdominal plantars, and the sensation intact. Similarly, the patient has got a cervical spondylosis and there is, is, a, is a cervical spine compression. So at the level of compression, the patient will have a lower motor neuron sign in the upper limbs, while for the lower limbs, if it is the compression of the cortical spine tracts, going down to, down to, the, to, the, to, the, to the lumbosacral area, the patient will have an upper motor neuron sign in the lower limbs and that will stimulate the, 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 the motor neuron disease in such cases. Then there's a long list where which we can have a confusion with the motor neuron diseases uh, in, in different diseases. Uh, from here, we go on to the um, treatment portion of motor neuron disease. By the way, um, it's mainly a sportive care. We have two drugs available. One is Relozole. Uh, it is marketed worldwide as Relutec, 50 milligram tablet to be given twice a day. It actually reduces the glutamate and use excitotoxicity. That actually uh, leads to the, I would say, prevention of the destruction of the horn cells or the motor neurons and that leads to 
bit of it extends the survival and the trichosmic free life by an average of three months. But there are a few side effects as well, as we would expect, like asthenia and dizziness, GI disorders, and elevation in the liver enzymes. At Darabon, uh, it is a recently, uh, I would say, invented drug. It's a free radical scavenger that is thought to reduce oxidative stress. 60 milligrams to be given with IV infusion over 60 minutes, and the treatment is started with a daily infusion for 14 days, followed by 14 days of treatment. Uh, it has got a side effects as we would expect with or with any pharmacologic agent. End of the day, this is the most important slide I would say as far as the treatment portion of amyotrophic lactic sclerosis or motor neuron disease is concerned. These, these are the symptomatic treatments and the symptoms which the patients will have, I would say. Like salary, a lot of patients in the oral cavity and the difficult to swallow and the patient's holding a handkerchief and the tendons of the family they're washing or sweeping the mouth and, and trying, trying to dry out the oral mucosa. You can do the glycopyrrolate, amitriptyline, transdermohyosine, transhexyphenidyl or botulinum toxin. These are the ways to dry, dry the oral cavities. Mind you, it's very, very common. Patients aspirate these patients and one drowns in its own saliva if you are not looking at this point. Pseudobulbar effect, that means unexpected laughing or crying. You can uh, give pay these patients dexamethorphan and quinidine. Patients will have a muscle cramps for which you can give carbamazepine. You can also give uh, oral beclofen, tizanidine, and dentrolene for the spasticity. Uh, patient uh, may develop dyspnea, they become anxious as well. You can give Medazolam or Lorazepam, or you can give a nebulized morphine and saline. You can also give uh, SSRIs for the depression cases. You need a bunch of people actually uh, involved in the, uh, the care of such patients, like neurologists, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech and language therapists, dietitian, uh, uh, case manager, general practitioner, district nurses, social worker and palliative care team. Again, uh, a supportive care. Uh, if you just look very carefully, the peg, the most important thing is if the patient vital capacity uh, is more than 50% of the predicted value, then you go for a PEG 2 insertion because in that case, there's a good chance the patient uh, will have a good life expectancy later subsequently. There are a few experimental drugs being tried worldwide, but we are not doing it here in Pakistan. Uh, I've already said about a few things about insomnia, respiratory insufficiency, suitable effect, pain management, as I said earlier in sight. Sportive care is the most important thing you can do. Uh, before I finish up, I'll give you an example of Mrs. K, a 76 year old lady admitted with increasing breathlessness, dysphagia, dysphagia and ataxic gait. She had a previous diagnosis of lacrimal stroke, but symptoms it was progressive. In lacrimal stroke, it's not progressive symptoms. So this lady had probably had another disease process going on in the background of a stroke in the past. Once you examined the patient, found that here she has got a thinner or a hypothenor wasting, clawing of the fingers, fasciculation of the arms, hand, the tongue, and beak, and nasal speech. This is typically a sign of a low motor neuron signs uh, involving the hands, and the upper limbs, and involving the tongue as well. Suspected respiratory muscle weakness was found and she was also found to have an aspiration pneumonia. She was seen by the neurology team and diagnosed with suspected motor neuron disease awaiting nerve conduction studies. Meanwhile, uh, as she had a swallowing difficulties, a pack tube insert in the month following diagnosis and it was attended by the multidisciplinary people, uh, as I said earlier. Uh, she kept on struggling with the secretions, though the pack tube was inside. So it is good for the feeding, basically, but about that one liter of saliva she is pouring out in the oral cavity, how she's handling those. So she was tried with the hyacin, was given the amitriptyline, and ultimately the Botox injection was injected into the portal gland. So non invasive ventilation was supplied as she was having a bit of difficulty in respiration, but Mrs. Cave was reluctant to use. Remember, these patients from the mental side was absolutely, they remain absolutely alert. Four months later, the patient was admitted again in the hospital with a certain duration in the mobility 
antibiotic was given for the recent urinary tract infection. The carers actually um, this used to see this patient on a daily basis, but the husband was also doing. He was still struggling. Speech now became very poor. She requires hosting for all the transfers, and she was very depressed, very sad. Later on, the patient felt difficult to understand speech, but one thing clear, patient consistently requests to go home. She was conscious, she was depressed, and she would say, I want to go home. Probably she knew that she's going to die and she wants to die in her home. She was very emotional, very tearful. Husband purpose, purposefully did not visit for the first five days as he felt he needed a break because he was also depressed. Via telephone contact, he felt that if she was becoming increasingly dependent, he could not manage at home and she needed to go into 24-hour care. Deprivation of liberty versus maintaining safety of the patient. Efforts made to maximize communication kept on going on. Independent advocates provided by the family support team for both patient and husband. Antibiotics switched, but Mrs. K continued to have a fever. Discussion with the family that Mrs. K was less well. Now the husband and the son came to visit at the hospice. The scene made not for antibiotics and not for the transfer to the hospital. Mrs. Gay passed away peacefully in the presence of her husband and daughter. So this is how it goes. Motor neuron disease, the rapidly progressive and the fatal disease, mean, median survival is three to five years. End of life care with all that this implies needs a coordinated sensitive approach. More than 90% of patients that die in this sleep as a result of increasing hypercapnia. Choking to death is not seen in clinical practice. About 30% of the patients survive beyond 5 years. Early onset disease is generally seen in 20% of the cases and how they, they differ, they survive for longer term due to slow progression of the illness and they tend to be male as you see in Stephen Hawkins case and have a limb rather than bulbar onset of the disease. Thank you very much. If you've got any questions, please write on on this and uh, you can always uh, ask me subsequently. Thank you very much.